Hi, everyone, and welcome to ABCs of Anesthesia for podcast and the YouTube channel. And today we're going to go through local anesthetics and we're going to try and make this really practical. So again, we're trying to make this like you're in your first couple of weeks or rotation anesthesia, listen to something on the way to work and have some really practical, useful information about local anesthetics. So you can, you know, if you ask the common questions, you're in the common scenarios at work, you'll have something to say and be able to make some useful decisions. And as always, there's the obvious disclaimer. This is really general information for educational purposes. If you're treating a specific patient, please consult your treating team, get all the advice you need and don't use this for any specific patient. So that's a disclaimer. Let's crack on with some information. So Kaz, what are we gonna be talking about? Uh, yes, so we are gonna talk about predominantly bupivacaine, ropivacaine and lignocaine. These are the most common local anesthetics that we use in Australia. We will also make a reference to levobupivacaine and cocaine, drugs that are quite available, but not are ones that we use very commonly. So as a, as a broad classification, the two main classes of local anesthetics are amides and esters, and these are to do with the functional groups um, that kind of connect the two parts of the local anesthetic molecule together. The, the specific details you learn when you do your part one exam, they're not really relevant, except to know that um, amides are metabolized hepatically, esters are metabolized by... Um, non-specific esterases in the blood. So therefore usually have a much slower, um, sorry, much quicker offset. Yeah, that's right. And one of those things, one of the tricks is, it, it's so strange that if you're, if the spelling of the an local anesthetic has two eyes in it, then it's an amide. And if, if it's only got one eye, it's an ester. So that's just the trick way to check whether something is ester or an amide. So cocaine is an ester, it's only got one eye. Uh, procaine, one eye, therefore it's an ester. Whereas most of the others, lignocaine, ropivacaine, uh, bupivacaine, prilocaine, these are all amide local anesthetics. So just a quick tip for how to know which one's which. So let's get into some of the interesting things. So uh, before we go on to some real case scenarios that will be useful for you to make decisions and be exposed to in, at your workplace, uh, let's talk about some max doses, the onset offset profiles and some of the toxicity. So max doses, you'll really need to know this well. Lignocaine, three milligrams, three milligrams per kilogram without adrenaline, seven milligrams per kilogram max dose with adrenaline. Ropivacaine is three milligrams per kilogram, levobupivacaine 2.5 milligrams per kilogram, and bupivacaine two milligrams per kilogram. Um, so that's the, that's the max dose. You really don't want to, that's a subcut max dose, and you really want to be careful if you're getting to that limit. Um, and also, it'd be, you have to really check with you know, the departmental guidelines about when you're happy to redose it, uh, because that's also a bit tricky, especially when you're running infusions. Now, the onset is often because of the percentage and the PK. So we won't go into a lot of detail about that, but essentially lignocaine often comes in one, 2% solutions and it's got a low PK, so it's fast onset. Whereas your ropivacanes and bupivacanes, they're in you know, just less concentrated mixtures, 0.2%, 0.75%. 0.5%, this means that it's going to be a slower onset agent. So that's the onset. Uh, and finally, the duration. The duration is mainly due to protein binding. And that's one of the real double-edged swords of local anesthetics. The fact that ropivacaine and bupivacaine are very highly protein bound, bound and also have affinity to this sodium channel. It means that they stick to that sodium channel, stop neurotransmission and just work for a long period of time, you know, like you know, onset will be you know, anywhere from like 15 to 30 minutes and offset maybe four, six hours longer in some regions of the body. But the fact is that they tight, bind tightly to that receptor. And what this means is that it's also toxic because of that, because not, sodium channels are in all your nervous tissue, but also in important tissues such as your heart muscle and your central nervous system. And that will cause you know, a significant amount of toxicity if you go over the maximum doses. So there's this interesting concept now called the CC to CNS ratio. And if you ever ask what this is, hopefully you'll be able to answer and sound pretty smart. It's a cardiovascular collapse to CNS symptom ratio. So it means that if, if there's a large CC to CNS ratio like lignocaine, which is seven versus bupivacaine, which is three, ropivacaine and lbupivacaine, which is five, it means that the time you start getting CNS symptoms, there'll be you know, the ratio of the concentration to get cardiovascular collapse is far more. So if it's got a short CC to CNS ratio, after you get your, you know, tingling, in, ringing in the ears or tingling around the lips, you got to be really careful because that, that could be the first signs of CNS symptoms. And then it's followed up with the fact that, um, you know, straight, straight after that, you might get cardiovascular collapse. So really important concept worth knowing. 
and just know that lignocaine is probably the safest one. Repivacaine, bupivacaine, pharmatoxic, you've got to be a lot more cautious with the, these medications. Exactly. So that's really talking about this, the, um, the margin for safety, isn't it? So if you start mm. playing those CNS um, symptoms with, with, lign- with any of the drugs, really, you, it gives an idea for how long you have. If that infusion is continuing or if, the, if you administered the drug before you get car- cardiovascular symptoms. That's right. And if we go into a bit of these symptoms, like often when I've given a big dose of regional anesthetic, then I'll always, or, or anytime that there's a chance that there could be a lot of toxic agent you know, taken up by the tissues, I'm then really, you know, I want to be, I want to be really cautious. So I'll ask the patient, do you get any ringing in your ears, tingling around the lips, metallic taste? If you get any of those signs, just let, let the nurse know, let me know, and we'll manage it from there. We'll stop the infusion and institute other, other management steps. Exactly. Mm. And there's a bit of a biphasic response in those CNS responses, aren't there? So initially you get um, an excited, excited response. So this is mm. the peripheral tingling, the, the hearing sirens, um, and then you start to get seizures. And this predominant initial um, excitatory effect is because you get preferential blocking of the inhibitory um, interneurons in the brain. And then as the, the concentration of CNS increases, you start to get blockage of all neurons. And that's when you get the depressive effects of um, sedation, coma, and death. So that's so in, the, in the brain, it's biphasic. And in the heart, um, what are the main effects you see in the heart with toxicity? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, there's, t- you know, there's um, a, probably a, quite a large spectrum. So arrhythmias generally, and those arrhythmias can be anything from by Gemini, ventricular tachycardias, bradycardias, even asystole. Uh, and then you know, that's obviously cardiac arrest at that point. Um, so yeah, th- those are the, 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 those main symptoms. Uh, and again, far more common to see these. If, if, if you had any accidental you know, intravenous ropivacaine or bupivacaine, like you just never do that. You'd never give ropivacaine or bupivacaine intravenously. Um, you know, th- those would be some of the things to think about if you were ever worried uh, looking, you know, make sure, making sure your patient is monitored, et cetera. Okay, so that's that's the basics. And I like that we can go through all those basic concepts. You know, again, there's so much to learn in your first part. You can go through the main onset, offset, max doses, toxic effects, and maybe a bit of ma- that management really quickly. So management, cease the trigger. So, so sorry, cease the infusion straight away. Give supportive management to your airway, breathing, and circulation and then any cardiovascular collapse, ALS management, seizure management, and then finally intralipid, as well as you know, planning for prolonged resuscitation if, if, if it's that bad. Um, now intralipid, like the doses are always a little bit tricky. Um, 1.5 mils per kilo as a bolus, followed by 15 mils per kilo over the next hour or so. So that's, imagine you get 100 mils, sorry, 1,000 mil or one liter vial of that 20% intralipid, that milky solution that you'll, you know, get from the crash cart or uh, from pharmacy, give a hundred mils and then run the rest of it over, over an hour. Yeah. And what's the evidence for the use of intralipid and look? Uh, I think, I think it's just animal studies, isn't it? So it, it doesn't have great evidence. You definitely don't want to forego your good advanced life support training. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence as well as animal studies that show that it might work. Have you, have you seen um, anything more than that? Like the theories about this? I haven't, I haven't looked into it um, in too much detail. Um, to well, yeah. one, of the, one of the theories is it's a lipid sink that potentially provides a reservoir for where it's localized that can be absorbed. But anyway, we, we digress. The important stuff can be covered really quickly, but let's get on to some scenarios. So Kaz, one of, the, one of the most common things before you even have to inject local yourself, you'll be in theater, maybe with a consultant or super, or maybe the, the consultants in the tier room, you're supervising the case and the surgeon says, how much local anesthetic can I give this patient? And there's a couple of scenarios. They'll either ask for at the end of a laparotomy, say how much 0.75 repivacaine or how much 0.5 bupivacaine, 0.5% bupivacaine you can give. Uh, how, do you, how do you come up with an answer for that? Yeah, I have stark memories to being um, in my quick care, yeah, getting getting asked this and uh, not having any idea how to do it. And I think even after you know the facts about the toxic doses, mm. um, the, the maths is it can be quite tricky when you're when you're a junior and you're stressing. So look, <laughs> I think the principle of this is if it's ropivacaine, um, you know, the maximum dose you can give is three milligrams per kilo, and this is generally down to um, in, a, in a normal um, in a patient with a normal BMI would be to their total body weight, but in an obese patient, we would be thinking about sometimes the ideal body weight. And this gets a bit gray. I think you want to consider that an obese patient has a, has a lower lean body mass than an 
uh, than what their total body weight would confer. So mm-hmm. um, I would use, you know, three milligrams per kilogram for pivocaine, two milligrams per kilogram for bupivacaine, mm-hmm. work out their maximum dose, and then use the, 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 the dilution that they're using. So the concentration of the local anesthetic and they work backwards and give them a volume. Mm-hmm. I always tend to take off about 10% of the, of the max before I tell them what to give, because I mean, they might need to top up if, if it's not working effectively, mm-hmm. they might need to top up if they find an area they haven't topical. So I just like to give that buffer initially now um do you have any any easier ways of working this out here yeah i remember coming up with this and i I thought so essentially the answer to the question of how much 0.75 percent rubivacaine or 0.5 percent bubivacaine the answer is always four milliliters per kilogram so that's a shortcut and the reason that works is 0.75 to 0.5 percent is the same ratio of its max doses 0.75 to 0.5 is three milligrams to two milligrams per kilo, same ratio. So that's why that works. So, you know, it, it's pretty easy. You don't have to do a lot of maths. Obviously check this because you don't want to get this wrong, but a 60 kilo person, 0.4 mils per kilo, that's just 24 mils. 70 kilo person, 28 mils. I'm literally just multiplying by four, divided by 10, dividing by 10. Uh, and that's probably the easiest way for your commonly used, you know, higher strength concentrations of ropivacaine and bupivacaine. Now, the other situation you might get is 0.2% rubivacaine. And I don't have a shortcut for that. You just literally have to go, what's the maximum dose? Let's say 70K person, three milligrams per kilo, 210 milligrams uh, total dose. And then I've just got to divide it by two milligrams per mil. So 0.2% is two milligrams per mil. And so, you know, that's literally 105 mils Hmm. of 0.2%. Now, that actually is a good point then. How do you convert percentage to milligrams per mil? Because that's a common thing that I think a lot of juniors might not know. Yeah, look, great question. And um, I think one of the things I got taught early on was just to move the decimal point over one place. So if it is, um, you know, 0.2% ripivacaine, then you have, then you move the decimal point from in front of the two to behind the two. So you suddenly have two milligrams per mil. Um, yeah. So if you have, you know, 1% lignocaine, that's 10 milligrams per mil. And that's a trick that I still use to this day. I can't yeah. remember who taught it to me. Yeah. Just, multiply, just multiply by 10. And that's good. Uh, and it always goes the way that gives you less volume. So you're always, you're always thinking, ah, oh, if only it went the other way. But it's, you know, it, it, and so don't get fooled. 1% does not mean one milligram per mil. 1% means one times 10, which is 10 milligrams per mil. Hmm. Okay, next thing you might be asked, uh, fascia iliaca block. You know, patients come with a fractured hip. Uh, you're called to the ward, maybe on the pain round. Uh, you get the patient monitored and you got to do this, te- you know, reasonably easy technique in the realm of the anesthetic techniques that you'll learn. How do you dose fasciliaca blocks? Yeah. So the fasciliaca blocks are what we call a planar block. So the goal is to um, deliver enough local anesthetic volume to cover the entire fasciliaca plane to ensure that you get coverage of you know, both the femoral nerve and the lateral cutaneous nerve and all the kind of tributaries that come out of it. So really we want to be giving big volume. So somewhere around the realms of kind of 40, even sometimes 50 mils, but generally I use 40 as a standard mm-hmm. and you can go pretty low with your concentration. So generally um, a normal dose I would give is 0.375% of repivacaine. Um, so that, that usually come so in, in 40 mils so they usually I usually take a 0.75 percent repivacaine that has you know 20 mils in it and then dilute that down to 40 mils so you get half the concentration is that what you do as well though yeah uh, I find that that's really good and I'll maybe talk about this in regional blocks I find that when I do regional blocks 0.375 seems to last almost as long as 0.75 but I can give a bigger volume and it doesn't give me as much motor block by far. So I find it a really useful dilution or concentration to use. Exactly. So, so like I said, a principle there for anyone who's relatively new to this stuff is if you, give a, if you give a higher concentration, you will get a faster block and you'll often get what we call a denser block. So in addition to covering the pain fibers, you will also cover sensory um, and then further down the track, motor fibers. So this is why we aim to give a lower concentration. So we just target the pain fibers because giving someone a dead leg is an ideal, particularly if they're going into something like an orthopedic surgery where they want to mobilize really soon after the operation. Cool. I think that's probably it for fasciliaca blocks. Let's go through some more examples. All right. So before, actually, before we move on, Lars, so mm. in terms of the fasciliaca block, so um, what about the choice of agent? Other than the fact that repivacaine comes in this beautiful concentration that we're comfortable diluting, yeah. could you use marcaine? Could, oh, sorry, could you use bupivacaine? Absolutely. Okay. You know, below the toxic dose, 
maybe dilute 0.5% to 0.25%. Um, some hospitals might have policies about this. You know, often regional infusions aren't of ropivacaine, but they're often of 0.25 or 0.125% bupivacaine. So yeah, I'd, I'd just go with whatever your boss tells you or whatever the hospital's doing, and that just keeps it simple. Right. And going back to those first principles you talked about onset, is mm. lignocaine an option here? And if you do use it, how would you use it? Uh, if I use lignocaine? Do you use lignocaine ever for an FI block? You know, I've never needed it in a hurry. Um, if I need a block in a hurry, then I'll, especially for a hip or any other situation for surgery, I'll use a femoral nerve block and I will um, try to make it faster. So essentially, I will try to combine ropivacaine and lignocaine together to make a fast onset and longer lasting block. This is probably an advanced ish technique. So not something you need to try and even volunteer to do because you won't be doing regional blocks, but essentially I make 2% lignocaine, 10 mils, 0.75% ropivacaine, 10 mils. And then that, so that makes 20 mils of solution. I want to add adrenaline so that I can use more lignocaine and there's a longer lasting block. So then I'll put 100 mics of adrenaline in that. So that's one mil of one in 10,000, the big 10 mil vial, one mil of that. And that gives me a one in 200,000 mix of adrenaline. So that's one of those easy ways of uh, kind of calculating that. So for regional techniques that I want to work quickly, that's, that's pretty much my formula. So a 70K person, that will be under the maximum dose. But if a person was under that 60 kilos, I'd have to recalculate to make sure everything's good. good. Yeah. So, so to walk me through an example of a regional block. So say an upper mm -hmm. limb block where you would want quick onset, longer duration. And, you know, how, how do you decide which patients yeah. you use this for? So depending on the hospital you're in, hospitals are very comfortable doing lots of regional. They'll have the patient down early. Uh, they'll have a whole block team potentially and a room set up that you can do this at your leisure. So you'll just put in ropivacaine or bupivacaine and you won't really worry too much about uh, trying to get a fast onset, but certain places you work, it isn't set up for that. So I really need, the, especially in that circumstance, I really want the block to work. I don't want to give sedation or I don't want to give a general anesthetic. Uh, I want a fast onset block to make sure it works. And that's why I do it. So any shoulder operation or lower limb operation uh, where I can use peripheral nerve blockage, that's, ex that's exactly what I do. Um, I'm not sure whether to go into too many examples, but you know, you got your interscalene, your auxiliary nerve, your supraclavicular blocks, and then your sciatic and posterior tibial common perineal nerve blocks as well for the lower limb. Uh, and, you know, pretty much for all of these, I'll, I will use that technique. Now you have variable onset of these blocks and that's pretty much because uh, the, the time to onset really depends on so many things, not just the local anesthetic, but how much local there is, how close it is to the nerve, is it surrounding the whole nerve? Is that nerve bundle really large? So now it's going to diffuse a whole way into it. Are you going a intraneural kind of advanced technique or a perineural technique? Uh, so there's all these other factors at play. Um, and again, you know, so some, some blocks will be super fast onset because of different factors, regardless of what anesthetic you use. And I guess this comes to the basic principle. You've got to test your block, um, especially mm. if you're expecting it to work as a as a sole anesthetic agent. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Lignocaine is a great idea for that. And how do, how do you calculate the maximum dose you can give when you're using two agents, maybe? Yeah, look, I, I, I go very cautiously with this. I use half the maximum dose of each. So in that example, 0.75. So if I'm using ropivacaine and lignocaine, I will just divide the maximum dose by half. So I'll go 1.5 milligrams per kilogram of ropivacaine and 3.5 milligrams per kilogram of lignocaine with adrenaline. And there's a whole lot of numbers kind of that we're throwing around. So we'll, we'll try to put this in the story notes so that you've got some, got some references for this. Excellent. So I think we've, so, you know, broadly with blocks, we have neuraxial and non-neuraxial, and we've talked mm. a bit about all the non-neuraxial blocks. So let's talk about neuraxial blocks, which is, a, which is a big part of what we do. Yeah, that's right. If you're an obstetric center. So um, spinals, like, do you want to walk me through the different kinds and what your yep. approach is for dosing? Okay, let's go with, if you try to keep it really simple, there's two spinals that you're going to do. One is a cesarean section spinal, and the other spinal is for your total knee replacements, your total hips, your fractured knots, and really any lower limb. And if you use this formula for most of your cases, you'll probably be okay. So cesarean sections, we generally use less volume than the, so the total hips and the total knees. Two point, so this is a pretty common formula. There might be a little bit of variance on this, but 2.2 mils of heavy 
uh, so 0.5% heavy bupivacaine, uh, plus 15 mics of fentanyl, which is 0.3 mils of it. And sometimes you might even add another intrathecal morph dose as well, like 100 mics of that. Now, so that, that's, that's, that's really the formula. It's in a you know, three mil syringe. You have a total volume of about 2.5, maybe 2.7 with the intrathecal morph, and that, that's it. Um, you use heavy bupivacaine, which is um, you know, combined with uh, glucose, and that allows you to put it into the intrathecal space. And then that distribution, because it's heavy, it's you know, high, hyperbaric. It means that in the CSF, it can actually you know, fall or rise in that CSF space, depending on what the position of the patient is. And this is really useful. For example, in cesareans, they have apparently less intrathecal volume because of epidural venous engorgement, complex stuff, don't really know, don't need to know it too much, but essentially if you have too high a block, you might put the patient head up. Whereas if your block isn't advancing far enough, you know, it's, it's a lot of effort to put, try to put the spinal in again. And having a heavy solution means that you can put the patient head down and try to get that block uh, further, you know, moving further to cover the region you need. And this, this movement will happen even up to an hour after you put this anesthetic in. So really, bit, you know, useful bits of information though. Yeah, excellent. So I, I always imagine the um, the the intrathecal space as a as a glass tube, and if you yeah. have this heavy heavy um, heavy local anesthetic, it drops to the dependent area, and then you can position the patient and and choose where you want to choose your own adventure. Really, <laughs> choose where you want to go. So you know you can use this a lot in um, patients who have fractured NOFs, for example, where um, you know you can um, put the block in and then move them all into a position of where it's most um, where you can get the local anesthetic to concentrate. Mm. Beautiful. So um, we've talked about dosing for obstetrics. We've talked. What's the what's the role of the fentanyl and the morphine? Sorry. Oh yeah, fentanyl. Look, it's it's been a while since I've looked at the exact evidence for it, but it stops it stops the the need for. Or it, I think it has a low incidence of block failure in cesareans having that extra fentanyl. Um, so just a more thorough, readily you know reliant block. Yes. Uh, I, th I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, I, I don't know the part two clinical stuff, but the part one non-clinical um, thing mm. is essentially the, the opiate acts on both the, at the, both the spinal cord level. And then there you do also get some um, absorption into the systemic system, uh, which then travels up, you know, the supraspinal centers and causes analgesia. So it's both a, a, a local effect as well as a systemic effect, which I find mm. really interesting. Mm. So actually the other thing, so spinals can also be for your total hip joints, total knee replacements and lower limb surgery. And, you know, there'll be a little bit of movement on this as well, but roughly, I think for most of my training, we did 2.7 mils of 0.5% heavy bupivacaine. And again, 15 mics of fentanyl or 0.3 mils to a total of, total of three mils of your spinal solution. Uh, you know, sometimes I've gone with plain marcaine and I, I'll use a bigger volume of that, 3.5, even up to four mils, but being very cautious with this. Um, yeah, and but I think that three mil dose is, Pretty pretty solid to start with for most UK most of your cases. And, and what's the rationale behind using a bigger dose of plain bupivacaine? Look, I'm not I'm not sure there's a much good rationale for it. So I, I, I might leave it up to you know having there's essentially more spread about how how much spread that plain marcaine can give, whereas hyper, hyperbaric or heavy marcaine has less amount of spread of you know how far how many dermatomes it can cover. So potentially you use a bigger dose just because of that variance in how much it will, it will actually cover. There's also a thought that maybe it's um, uh, more cardiovascularly stable, but I'm not sure if this is actually borne out in evidence, mainly probably anecdotal. Interesting. Okay, let's go to the next scenario now. Kaz, because you're in training, you're doing far more epidurals than I am. There's a couple of situations, insertion of the epidural and what you give, then what infusion you run, and finally, you want to top up the epidural. So they call it topping up the epidural because you're now going to give a much more effective dose, a bigger dose of local anesthetic if you have to convert to a cesarean section. So what do you reckon? Insertion, what do you do? What, what do you give for epidurals? Yeah, good. Look, so, um, you know, you put in the epidural and we can talk about this in a, in a different format of it later, but mm. um, generally you give a test dose and then a loading dose. So a test dose is five mils of 0.2% ropivacaine um, and you give that dose and generally you should wait at least five minutes. So um, once I get the epidural in and I've threaded the catheter through, I give a bolus and while I'm securing the epidural and 
um, getting everything else ready um, is kind of your waiting time, okay? And, and the point of this test dose is really just to make sure you're not in the intrathecal space, that you haven't accidentally um, done a dual puncture and it, are, are delivering drug into the spinal, um, the intrathecal space, sorry. So mm. if we gave 0.2% of rupivacaine intrathecally, you know, that, that's, a, that's a pretty big dose. So you should start to get um, some heaviness in your legs or some degree of motor block, um, and that should be quite noticeable. And... Um, this is the purpose of the test dose. And, and there are some cases in different different literature arguing for a bigger test dose, but I found five to be pretty effective. And I have, mm -hmm. and I think that's a guideline and, for most places. And, and that makes sense as well, because um, the total dose is very similar to your spinal dose. Mm -hmm. So spinal is 0.5% and you know, 2.5 mils. And now you're giving here um, yeah, 0.2% and five mils. It's about the same mats. You're giving 10 milligrams, give or take, and that should give the effect uh, or the warning signs that you're looking for, which is a motor block. So yeah, it makes sense. And, and you know, whenever you've done obstetric spinal, you know, the second you you put it in, you take everything off, you clean the back and you lie the, um, the mom mm. on the bed, they can't move their legs in most cases. So it works very quickly and you should see that in this scenario as well. So then the, the loading dose, um, generally most protocols call for um, kind of sequential dosing of five mils every five minutes onwards as well. And, and I think this is quite a safe thing to do. So my next thing is, um, you know, I do another five mils um, and while they're getting positioned back into bed and then I do my notes, that takes about five minutes and then I give another five mils and, you know, have a bit of a chatter um, for, for, the, for it to work. So generally you give in total about 15 mils. Again, I've given 20, I've given less in smaller patients, but generally as a standard, I think 15 is really, really safe. Yep. Um, and that's kind of what I usually do for my epidurals. Um, I, and just quickly, so you've got your let's say you've drawn up your 20 mil solution of 0.2% and you potentially given a hundred mics of fentanyl into that solution. Uh, and so your five mils has a bit of fentanyl in it as well. So, you know, it, they'll get a good decent dose in the epidural space after you dose up. Exactly. So, so there's a couple of ways of doing this. The way I've, I've taught and I quite like is putting the hundred uh, micrograms of fentanyl into the 20 mils. So then they, then you should get five mics per mil of fentanyl in your solution. Mm -hmm. And then I just give that, you know, in five, five, five. So usually about 15. Um, some people, I think I have heard of giving the full hundred micrograms as a bolus. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are a few concerns about this. One concern is if you're accidentally in the interest, you're not sure you're giving a big, big dose. It's, it's a big whack and you get a fair bit of um, central effects. Mm. So I'd be cautious of that. Um, yeah, if you run now, the, the epidural's in, it's working beautifully. You come back for that hero moment where the pregnant lady says, oh, thank you so much. You've taken away my pain, Kaz. Uh, and what do you give, uh, how do you run that epidural for the rest of their labor? Yeah, so, so as far as I understand, this is very center dependent. Um, yeah. So there's a few options. You can run a background infusion. You can run a PCEA, which is a patient controlled epidural analgesia. So they get a button just like a PCA that they press. Or you can get PCEA plus mandatory bolusing, so an auto bolus. So um, in that scenario, you get an automatic bolus every five minutes. On top of that, the patient can top up with the patient's so, control. Yeah, a lot of information, do whatever the center has protocolized and that's safest and probably best for that center, that, that's easy. Uh, the more urgent situation now, your epidural's working and specifically it is working because you wouldn't want to top up an epidural that you were questioning. It's working and you want to top it up for a cesarean section. So no longer just labor analgesia, but for a full anesthesia for a cesarean section. What do you, what do you do? Yeah, excellent. So look, this is a scenario where it's, it's relatively urgent. Things are moving very quickly. You get a mom with an epidural um, inside you, either for a cesarean section or potentially for a repair of a perineal tear or something. But in the case of a, of a cesarean section, I, the first thing I always do is I always check the block. Um, you know, you need to make sure that you're not topping up a block that's already very effective, in which case you're running the risk of getting a high block with additional volume or deepening that block for no reason. So check the block with some ice. I think that's mandatory. Um, I don't know if you would agree, La. Mm, always check the block, but I always need to give a stronger solution anyway. So even if the block is up to T4 with 0.2%, that's not enough an anesthesia. So I, I need to give probably at least 10 mils on average, no matter how high the block is it already is. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So look, the, the, the top-up solution, um, again, I'm, I'm sure this varies, but what um, we've kind of been taught to use is you get 2% lignocaine um, and I draw up 17 mils of 2% lignocaine and then you draw up 2 mils of your sodium bicarbonate solution um, and you all, um, yeah, so, and then you also 
drop one mil of one in 10,000 adrenaline. So that's 100 micrograms of adrenaline that you're putting into 20 mil. So it's five micrograms of adrenaline. Um, so, so, you know, the, the role of the sodium bicarbonate, again, we won't get into the nitty gritty of this, even though I find this fascinating, is the concept of PKA um, and yeah. essentially making the solution, um, you know, more basic. And what you're essentially doing is you're increasing the unionized component of the local anesthetic and making the onset faster. Yes. The role of the adrenaline is to cause, so, so lignocaine is inherently vasodilating compared to uh, in relation to bupivacaine and ropivacaine. So we give adrenaline to cause local vasoconstriction to stop the drug from being washed away essentially from the area you're injecting it to. So that's the role of the two, two additives. Mm. And then what kind of volumes would you give for a standard top up? So you said you generally find you at least have to give 10. Yeah. I, I can't remember a time I had to give less than 10. Uh, I'm not saying it's not possible. So I would generally give five, then another five mils of that exact solution. And sometimes I need to give another five. R rarely do I need to give 20 mils. Yeah. 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 And again, a practical point, I think um, it's good practice if you weren't the one who put in the, in the epidural to check the notes. Um, and, you know, the things you'd be checking, checking for is ensuring there wasn't a traumatic insertion, that there were multiple attempts or anything really that may, or, or if there wasn't a confirmed dural puncture, that you just want to make sure that there's no chance that the, that the solution you're giving is going to travel into thickly um, and cause adverse effects. And I think if you're topping it up, it's your onus to check, check the... Um, the previous notes. Excellent. So I think we've covered kind of, um, you know, neuraxial in, in, in pretty good detail there. So another instance where we use um, local anesthetics is are in Beer's block. Now I haven't done one of these because I, I, even though I've done a fair bit of ED, <laughs> you know, walk us through what, what your approach is for this. Uh, yeah, process. first of all, very advanced technique. I mean, you're giving lignocaine or other local anesthetics intravenously in big doses because you're trying to get that intravenous local anesthetic going to target the nerves to make it less painful for fracture reduction, say, but like a Collie's fracture. Um, the, the best thing I can say is look up the Royal Children's Hospital guidelines for doing a beers block because that it's a fantastic guideline, has a lot of really good detail in it, and we'll put the links in the story notes for that. Uh, but essentially, it's uh, aside from you know having the right patient getting consent and all the usual setup and everything and monitoring, um, what you're trying to do is you have a double tourniquet, uh, so you really want to prevent any local anesthetic going into the systemic circulation. You put that on the arm uh, and then you put an intravenous cannula. Actually, you need two of them. So one is in the arm that you're actually going to anesthetize and another one for resuscitation and other fluids and things in the other arm. And what you do then is you give a dose of lignocaine. And so follow the guidelines on this. Each hospital may have different guidelines, but the Royal Children's Hospital is a really useful, useful guideline. Now, so that's all good and well. Uh, you know, you wait the right amount of time, give the right dose, have all the monitoring, and hopefully this works really well for your, you know, for your fracture reduction. But one of those things that they talk about very subtly is that, first of all, you should put a distal cannula in. So one thing that has been reported that happens, occasionally people put a cannula in the cubital fossa, and that's because that's quite near the tourniquet. When you inject your lignocaine with any kind of syringe, the pressure that you can exert from that can often overcome the tourniquet pressure. And there's been really terrible incidents that have happened uh, where this, where something like this has occurred and people have given lignocaine or other drugs uh, syst systemically uh, because they had a cubital fossa vein. So always have a peripheral cannula, not a cubital fossa cannula for this technique. Mm, great tip. And, and would you remember what kind of doses you use? For the block, um, you know, they talk about giving lignocaine at a dose of three milligrams per kilogram. Um, which is, you know, at, at a max dose of 200 milligrams or 40 mils. That's pretty much the, just the simplest explanation for that. And so probably, do, probably don't need to go into that in too much more detail. Often they dilute this. So they might dilute 1% with an equal quantity of normal saline to make a 0.5% solution. So that way you get a bit more volume as well. Yeah, excellent. Good. So I think the other two scenarios I can think of is really, you know, uh, topical anesthetics. So stuff like em emla cream and uh, oh, yeah. cream, which you can use um, on the skin to reduce the pain of uh, uh, IV cannula insertion. Um, probably not much to say on that. I think some of the science behind this is really interesting, but probably a bit out of the scope of this conversation. Mm -hmm. And the other one that I always found really interesting was eye blocks. Now, they were like, you do a lot of eye blocks um, and I still find your local anesthetic mixture do impossible to remember. But do you want to give us a, just a bit of an overview and introduction for how you... Of, of, yeah, of, of, of absolutely. <laughs> so it's interesting. Um, 
there's so many different formulas that you can use. And I've, I've seen everything used. I've seen 2% lignocaine with 0.6% rapivacaine, 2% lignocaine with point, um, what was it, point, uh, 4% bupivacaine, 2% lignocaine by itself, and all of these combined with or without 30 units per mil of hyalase. Um, I've also seen rapivacaine used alone, bupivacaine used alone. So I've seen every kind of mixture. And in my, in my experience now, with my fast surgeons and very little downtime, I essentially distilled this to 2% lignocaine with 30 units per mil hyalase. Now I've got some high block videos they go into this in you know decent detail, so you could you know copy that formula and see how how I make that up uh, on, on the YouTube channel, which we'll provide a link to. Uh, but essentially, I just want a fast onset block that lasts for long enough, and that provides absolutely what I need. Um, interestingly, when I've done these blocks without hyalase, it's not fast enough for a fast surgeon. It's not fast enough without the, without the hyalase. So I'd say that's the minute the most minimalist technique that I could use. So, so what is hyalase for, for those who might not know? Oh yeah, so it's a hyaluronic acid and it's like an enzyme that just breaks down certain components of tissues. That's probably the simplest way of explaining it um, and it just allows for a faster block. Excellent. Good. Well, I think we've um, mm. covered everything I can think of for local anesthetic. But thanks so much for joining us uh, once again. If you enjoy this episode, please, um, you know, like, rate on the podcast and share it with your friends. Um, if you have any comments or feedback or anything you'd want us to talk about, please email us. We love hearing from you and we always endeavor to get back to you as well. And uh, we'll see you next time for another episode. Thanks. See you next time. Mm-hmm.